sorry about that. Um, so it turns out I was still streaming to someone to another Twitch account. So I was just basically talking to no one for the past minute or two. But good thing I realized now and like not not later, I guess. Oh geez. Um well now we're here. Now I'm finally streaming to my actual Twitch account, which is good. Um <laughs> Okay, so let me try to recap what I was saying. Um, so, uh, right, we're in Half-Life 2 Episode 1. I was uh, I was trying to recap what was happening previous weeks, which is where we were in the Citadel, which is like a giant alien skyscraper. Uh, there's a nuclear reactor in the skyscraper that's going wrong, so then we had to go in there and fix it and stabilize it, and now we have to somehow escape the skyscraper and escape through the city, and that's the rest of Episode 1. So let's load my game and get into that and start escaping. So this is around the end of chapter two we're in now. Um, wait, hold on. I think my speakers are wrong. Let me get this. Sorry. You know, when you do all these different speaker setups, it's just so awful how... Okay, no, sounds okay. Um, okay, so um, we are escaping. There's an alarm going off, and here's our sidekick, Alex. Let's start escaping. This is the right way, right? Oh god! So they actually spawn all these characters. They spawn all those soldiers right behind us. Um, to encourage you to run away, I guess. So we did that running away, and then she was able to lock the door behind us. So, oh wait, there's no game sound. I thought I fixed the game sound. Hold on, sorry. Um, I fixed it when I was streaming before. Okay, how about now? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so... Oh, right. Something I was talking about when I when, when I had that false start was that Half-Life has really cool sound design with, like, menus and, like, interface, right? Like, like listen to this sound. Don't listen to the tortured voices in the background. Listen to these button sounds where it's just like... I don't even know what that is, right? It's like... It's like a cat purring or something. Like. It's it's like when you go over these menu options, you're like petting a cat and it's like. I don't know, it, it's like growling, but in that like nice soft growl that like cats do sometimes. Um so it's it's gorgeous, but also like the use sound. Like, do you hear that? Like, like that's the sound it makes when you're pressing the interact button, but there's nothing to interact with. So that's half, that's like the source engine. It's actually the same sound as Half-Life 1, um, where it's like, what, wait, what's happening? What? Oh, roller mines. Um, I don't know, I just like how it's like abstract, but it's also like beautiful and fitting. The best sound design often is. So this is like a tutorial to remind you about a mechanic that the game introduced to us like an hour ago, but we obviously forgot about how it worked, where we can take these enemy roller mines and if I bring the roller mines to her, she can convert them. Hey, what happened? Useless little roller mines. Where they can like roll around and shock the other enemies. The AI scripting here is kind of annoying. 
and weird where yeah these roller mines weren't doing a very efficient job so then a soldier actually walked up here um, you can see they tried to do a bunch of like scripting stuff to fix that where for example um, oh no my friends are dying where they uh, had the uh, soldiers take the uh, roller mines as a higher priority in the AI engagement so um, they ignored me, the player, and instead they tried to shoot these mines. But the mines are, of course, invincible. Like you can't, they couldn't actually kill the mines. Anymore. Now we can walk into here, and now we're on a train. Well, that was a nice clean getaway. I don't know what's in this copy we made, but they're not thrilled about us having it. You know, all things considered, we're not. It's a stalker car. God damn the combine. This is what happens to you if you resist. This is what happens to you if you resist. The stalker faceplate well, design the is very good. At the wrong time. God, I hope you don't remember who But a lot of other enemy design is still kind of weird. Like, okay. I don't like the leg stump stuff we'll see where going on headed. here. It seems kind of like a weird ableist thing i don't know but it's it's weird what's weird about this is that uh there's another character in this game eli who is also um disabled um who has a prosthetic leg so that's kind of this game's i think weird relationship with disability and bodies where it's like on one hand it's trying to stereotyped it as like grotesque or alien or monstrous but on the other hand a central character is disabled and important and interesting so no oh, when am i i was missing the whole scripted sequence what was i saying oh now it's growling at me oh my god so scary And then this is just like, I don't know, another weird scene too. It's like... It reminds me of uh, something that came up a few months ago, which is the... Sorry, I'm just pausing on this, but... Um, there's like a Harry Potter free-to-play game where, if, where uh, if you can't like pay enough money to get enough stamina, um, then it places your character, your Harry Potter character, in like mortal danger, being like strangled and like wrapped to death, and it's it's like really like distressing for children. You have to imagine, and this is kind of like a similar situation. Wait, why isn't this working? Am I not doing this right? I'm trying to... Why is it not... I'm trying to pull... Oh, okay, wait. Am I pulling? Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> um... Is she being sarcastic? Because I was kind of just staring at her for a while. I To me, there's just like a weird Ruta narrative dissonance to me about this moment, but... To me, there's also relaying back to that Harry Potter game thing. There's just a really weird thing about how in AAA or gamery games, we pretend we're so different or so much better than like a filthy casual mobile free-to-play game, but that was basically the same exact form of emotional manipulation and stuff that happened just now and oh is she okay how do i like and then when you do this in games it's just bringing up how we can't say something nice to her we can't like hug her we can't like hold her hand there's so much in the realm of interactivity that we can't actually do to support the emotion and feelings that video games are supposed to reportedly supposedly make and feature as 
a, a complicated emotional art form. So it's just sad that it's like, oh, I can't come for Alex. I can like shoot things at her, but I can't like pat her on the shoulder. It's just video games are just drawing attention to themselves about how they're really insufficient and underdeveloped. And it's, it's weird when video games do that, I think. But on the other hand, if you don't try to do anything, the alternative is for video games to just be about shooting, to just be about what video games are good at being. Um, which is also not the best thing. Hold up a sec. I gotta catch my breath. Okay. Well, this might not be as easy as I thought. I will say, we're in the same boat as the other This is a good now. scene here. On foot to a train station. Where it is convincing. Let's head for the that surface. this character Alex, it is convincing that she would want to like take a breather and sit after that like traumatizing moment. So that makes sense. And then that's also a neat way for them to remind us about our game objective and also to uh, do like more exposition. So we have to like, she just told us we have to escape the city and it's going to be dangerous and stuff. So right now we're at the beginning of chapter three, which is called Low Life. Careful, I hear turrets. So what the NPC is talking about here is these turrets right here. Uh, if you played before Half-Life 2, um, which is what many Episode 1 players would have done, if you played the previous game, uh, you would know that these are pretty dangerous and they will like shoot the hell out of you. But here they're just clicking harmlessly because they're out of ammo. And this is actually, I think, a good form of design where it's like a naturalistic uh, reminder about this enemy and how this enemy functions. It's like mixing up the formula a little bit. Oh, what if these turrets actually run out of ammo? They actually never do run out of ammo, usually. So it's interesting to see them in this different state. And then we're also encountering again for the first time these combine mines. The way the combine mines work is you can throw them at monsters and then they're like bombs. Or you can pick them up and then drop them again. And when you drop them again, they change color. And now that they change color, they won't attack you, but they'll attack someone. some scenery. Looks okay, I guess. It's just a little bit bare, though. I mean, here you can see a lot of this uh, low-poly geometry here. That just... It seems like they didn't put like much effort into it. But also, again, yeah, no, no player's gonna look up at this and be upset. Just me, because I'm a weirdo. So we're crawling I can't see a through these. So that's a reminder to, that we have to turn on our flashlights. Um, with the flashlight mechanic, you'll notice, first of all, this is probably the most impressive thing about episode one, which is if you shine your flashlight at Alex, she will actually cover her face, uh, which is which is really shocking, I think, to most players when they first do it, because this almost never happens in games, right? People usually never react to flashlights in games. 
So the fact that she's doing it brings her closer from the NPC side of the spectrum more towards like another player. She seems more like autonomous when she's reacting to this in a way that no other NPC would ever react. So th I think it's a very powerful moment and a really powerful gesture. But I've also actually given talks on the Alex episode one flashlight code. And if you Google the code on GitHub, you'll actually see it's really complicated. There's 10 different if statements because you'll notice that if I shine the flashlight at her again, it actually takes her a while to cover her face again. Because there's actually a cooldown on this. Because if Alex was always doing this constantly, she would become inconvenient to the player, right? It means if she's covering her face, that means she's not shooting her gun at other monsters. So there's all these if statements in the code to make sure that Alex, sometimes she'll cover her face, but after the first time she covers her face, she's actually in this cooldown mode where she'll ignore the flashlight for a little bit so that she's still useful and stuff. So even we need to her autonomy and even her expression as like another human does have its limits. Um, so over here we see uh, another tutorial. How are we gonna get this, open? this is a locked door Let's see if we can with an unbreakable window so we can see we're supposed to go in there. But uh, to get your attention, they put a little glowy battery here as a breadcrumb to attract your attention so that you see this vent. And when you see this vent, you know you can go inside. I've heard stories about you and air ducts. Dr. Kleiner says whenever he locked himself out of his office, you and Barney used to compete to see who could get in fastest without using a key. And then you just heard her tell some random bullshit story that's obvious fan service. Which is kind of annoying, but... Oh, and then this is obviously a tutorial meant to teach you how to use flares, to pick up the flares. It's a weird fan service callback, lampshading to how Half-Life always makes you crawl in these vents, in these unrealistic, weird, pointless vents. Um, oh, in the chat, um, you, you Gurkity, uh asks, um, where can we find the talk on Half-Life 2 Episode 1, Alex Flashlight AI? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember what talk that was, uh, but you can also just, I have receipts, you know, you can just also check it yourself if you google the uh, Half-Life 2 source SDK code on GitHub, you can search for the Alex episodic code and see for yourself all the different if statements for controlling her behavior. Here, we cannot jump past this fence, so this is still training us to use the gravity gun to pick things up. And then of course another flare that you can accidentally pick up so that you can see flares are useful, they give you light when your flashlight will not. But this is also a hard gate, and this is also a gate that I believe someone in the chat was talking about. Tugala is mentioning that in episode one, you technically don't have to fire a gun, except, I guess, at this moment. Where there's a padlock on the other side of this door, and I cannot use the gravity gun to blow it up. So this is in a hard gate where we had to learn that we or realized that we could pick up the shotgun here. And now that we have the shotgun, I can walk over and blow that up. And I had to blow that up and go get Alex because it seems I cannot progress without her. Is that true? Why can't I progress without her? Oh, because you have to turn on this light switch and let her in. Hey, and you found a gun! Hey, you found a gun. And now comes another 
wave of set pieces in episode one where it's very dark and because it's so dark we have to use our flashlight and oh gosh Um, oh, in the chat people are saying the audio is desynchronized, it seems, but my face cam audio is in sync, which actually makes no sense to me. I guess it's different audio tracks being encoded on Twitch. Uh, well, I'm probably not going to restart my stream. I'm probably just going to power through it, so uh, apologies for all the audio desyncing issues. I don't know how to solve it except for restarting OBS probably so um, deal with it sorry that's me but anyway I was saying this new set piece is about uh, how we're playing buddy cop with Alex I have to shine the flashlight at enemies and then when I shine the flashlight at enemies she can shoot them <laughs> And then she also has, you can see, NPC AI cues, where she had to explicitly tell me to keep the light on that zombie. Or I can just shoot the zombies myself, but they also give you very little ammo in this sequence, so you actually don't really have that many options. Makes sense if it was powered by the Citadel. And now we're revisiting this other enemy type, the Antlion. More monsters returning from Half-Life 2. And now here's a reveal. This is, what the hell is that? a new type of hmm. enemy. A combine zombie. That's... That's like a um, a, zombine. a zombine. So right? the zombine enemies <laughs> zombine, <yeah>. are <laughs> combine soldiers who are also zombies. So this again speaks to Half Life Two Episode One's resourcefulness. Look out. It's kind it's of the grenade. greatest hits of Half Life Two being remixed into new kinds of set pieces and new kinds of encounters. So. That's why, again, to me, I think Half-Life 2 Episode 1 is very solid design and is very good work from, like, a basic uh, game design perspective. But maybe from other perspectives, this is probably the least favorite of the Half-Life 2s just because it's so resourceful, nothing ends up feeling truly new. Everything ends up feeling like something you could have done in the original Half-Life 2 a little bit. One other risky thing about this whole set piece is that it's all about being in a dark tunnel which is usually something that video games avoid, pitch black darkness here. Because usually a flashlight, timed flashlight mechanics are usually kind of annoying the players. Um, you know, CC Doom 3. Or play basically any, play basically any modern AAA game and they will usually... Oh, and players set them on fire. That's weird. Um, play any like modern contemporary AAA game and almost always it will never be pitch dark like this. It will always give you some kind of minimum ambient level of light so that you don't really need a flashlight. Keep that 
It would be cool if she could get caught by the barnacles, but I don't think she can. Dynamic light is also unusual in Half-Life 2, just because um, the way the source engine is configured, dynamic light is still basically using Half-Life 1 era technology. So it's still a pretty inefficient dynamic light source. It's not like a proper dynamic light thing. Oh. That's another thing introduced in episode one, um, where she like um, like need that zombie to death right there. Um, that's like a special, unique um, like character scripted sequence thing that usually did not happen in the original Half-Life 2. But that's one technology investment they started making with the episodes where they enter these scripted animation transitions that feel more emergent and more immediate during the game. Instead of feeling like, this is a cutscene, this is a cutscene. Look at all this content. Okay, so we turned on that light. That didn't really help us. I guess we have to backtrack now? Is that what that's about? Oh, and Alex saves you if you get caught by the barn. Cool. Oh, and then it opens this door. That's right. These are blackhead crabs. Blackhead crabs, when you get hit by them. Wait, why aren't they affecting me? Did I turn on god mode? Oops, I've had god mode on the entire time. <laughs> um, well, hopefully we see more blackhead crabs so you can see what they do. I just thought I was really good at this game. But it turns out, I'm a dirty cheater. And now we're entering one of the new or like semi-new settings in Half-Life 2 Episode 1 which is the parking garage kind of biome where we're going to be ascending and descending these various levels of a parking garage. And again, very resourceful, right? Half-Life 2 already has all these concrete props we can reuse and all these concrete textures we can reuse and all these ruined cars so it's not, it's not difficult to imagine making a parking garage. Maybe they made a new wall texture. Maybe this is a new wall texture. And maybe they made these giant P decals. But other than that, there's not much new in the way of assets. And again, I think that's why gamers don't like episode one too much because gamers and customers are very, cons consumer kings are very highly tuned to asset reuse. And once things start feeling like it's asset reuse, uh, heavy recycling, it's like, no, I'm not getting my $50 worth, right? Or however much episode one was. This is also a moment for us to learn, oh. We just learned two new mechanics at a time. So we just learned that antlions come out of these holes. We previously maybe forgot about that. And we're also learning this other mechanic where you have to hold down the use key to open up this very slowly spinning door. So this is kind of like a soft gate where you where it's not specifically like you don't specifically have to like necessarily do this. I mean, you kind of have to, but it takes the player, it's not a lock on a door. The player has to realize, wait, I can't keep doing this because they'll keep coming over and knocking me away from the wheel and then I can't keep opening the door. There's also some NPC barks coming from Alex to tell us that we have to block the antlion hole. So that's kind of your cue to gravity gun the car into the hole. And then it's very cute, the level designer, when it detects, when the trigger detects a car has fallen into this hole, they play some sounds, some metal crushing sounds, 
and they even add a very subtle uh, physics explosion, invisible physics explosion beneath the car to make it seem like the ant lines are trying to burst through the car out of the hole. Which is a neat little touch with minimal asset needs. Uh, and the chat, Quasayada asks, uh, there's so many textures in general, how are Half-Life 2 textures created? Um, and I think, you can't quite quote me on this, but, oh, wait, I can get hit by these. When you get hit by these black head crabs, your health goes down to one, temporarily, so then you have to, like, run away. So black head crabs will never kill you by themselves, but in combination with something else, they will kill you and they're very dangerous. Which is just brilliant bubble design. More games should probably steal the black head crab damage mechanic. Uh, but what I was saying, oh yeah, Quasi Adras, uh, how are the textures in Half-Life 2 created? Uh, if you look in the Half-Life 2 Raising the Bar book, uh, they show some of their texture workflow, which was um, sometimes the environment textures would be uh, mostly photo based and then sometimes they'd bring it into like they would model it out and then render out a normal map um, but I think what's more common with Half-Life 2 is that they have their own internal photo source libraries and then they manipulate the photo source and then generate the normal map in Photoshop probably or maybe they hand paint the height map uh, they probably this is kind of before ZBrush or even like substance designer became very pervasive. This is 2007. So in this era of game art, you're not seeing a lot of that stuff yet. Um, people are you sculpting most, reserving sculpting mostly for characters and not really for environment art. Also the environment art again is very low poly in this era. So when I turn this on, you can see how low poly this red geometry is. So. So you can see it's not really like super high fidelity. So that's why they probably just generated stuff based on photo texturing. Oh no, I'm gonna die. Help me, Alex, help me. She's saving me? Okay, she's saving me. Good. So one thing, uh, one other thing that I like about the whole conceit of episode one, which is Alex is a good NPC who's super able at killing enemies, um, is that it does tap into that central juicy thing that we like about a lot of these first person shooters, which is watching AIs kill other AIs and then you kind of just stand there and watch things happen. So this certainly taps into that. Notice she's not covering her eyes because she's in combat mode, so she's not going to cover her eyes. But I think notice just one interesting thing about first-person shooters is watching AIs kill other AIs. So in that sense, so much of our fascination oops that was too close of first person games is just watching stuff happen is watching things do things to other things so that leads me to an argument are walking simulators really that radical if we compare that core idea to how supposedly triple a mechanics heavy games operate which is that we like watching stuff happen in front of us and that's already so much of the joy of playing these games anyway. So in a sense, I think walking simulators are kind of just honest about what the joy of video games is, which is 
maybe the joy of simulation, the joy of watching yeah. stuff happen. Or, um, oh yeah, and in, in chat, Megaspell brings up stuff like Salty Bed, right? Which is uh, a Twitch channel, or maybe it wasn't always a Twitch channel, but it's a channel where you can watch, or video stream, where you can watch AI fighting game figures fight each other um, and bet on them. Well, bet fake money on them. Notice we're getting a sense of progression here. <laughs> Ooh, I don't know, I'm sneezing. Instead of P6, we're now at P5, so that's like a counter, that's like a level counter telling us that we're progressing. There's an antlion hole that's probably going to erupt soon. It should feel very ominous to players. Now that we walk past them, we've seen what can happen with these. So the fact that this one is dormant is not very comforting. And sure enough, we see them all erupt. But now that we know we need to look for cars, Now the game becomes looking for giant car props. Which is helpful in a parking garage. I think we have to run up here. Yeah, here's a car over here. So again, conceptually, I think this is good, solid level design, right? We're in a parking garage. Parking garages have cars. We need to use cars to block the ant mine holes. Which is conveniently reusing a lot of assets. That's resourceful. That's good design. It's taking the Half-Life enemy menagerie into an interesting place. And it also does something interesting where now we're looking for cars. Previously, we didn't even care about car props. But now we look at car props and dollar signs appear in our eyes. And we've become so much more attuned to it now. Wait, how do I get this car though? Uh-oh. We have to climb another level up and then drop down from that broken seat. Okay, so this set piece is also beautiful too. I'm just going to turn on no target so I can tour guide. Um, this set piece is also beautiful too because um, you want to climb on these thin bars so that the ant lines don't knock you off, right? So you want to be careful not to fall off. But it's using these cross beams, which is a form of architecture, like a reinforced concrete architecture, that you'd expect to see in a parking garage. So the parking garage theme supports various challenges in various encounter designs here in a very naturalistic feeling way. The one way this doesn't work at all is this. Why, why are there random valves in this parking garage to open doors? Who even uses valves to open doors? That doesn't, doesn't make any sense at all. So, you know, it's not not the best but in a video game sort of way with video game logic it works pretty well oh I should turn off the so now we have our third car 
And now with the third car, we can block stuff. And now no more ant lines can come out. And now we can walk up to that other valve we saw and open a door. So from a very formal technical perspective, this is very well done because it's making use of the theme in multiple ways. Uh, good use of verticality, uh, good asset reuse in a fresh way. Um, but if we wanted to criticize this more, we might argue that this is essentially still a very boxy feeling space, still very rectilinear, still not much like there's no hero set piece or hero building here. This is just a set of increasingly larger concrete rooms. So you could also level that critique at this and that's certainly valid. But this, this is classic level design. Like if a student was able to do this or a level design applicant was able to come up with this and present this, they would have a good chance of getting a job because this is basically what a AAA studio would be looking for from like a single player combat based level designer, right? Someone who is resourceful, who can come up with a theme, who can come up with variants on that theme. Um, but all this stuff can only happen if you have a base game to build levels on top of. So I recently tweeted something very salty against AAA Studios, which is that they never release their tools anymore. And when they don't release their tools, it's impossible for me to train level designers to see something like this and think, oh, this is good level design. Even though it's kind of boxy, even though it's kind of all these concrete rooms, formally, gameplay-wise, this is really well done and they did everything right. And that tweet has gone mildly viral. I mean, not very viral, like 1,500 faves. Um, to show that I'm I'm right. Maybe I'm right about stuff sometimes, you know? Maybe I'm not full of bullshit. Maybe I know what I'm talking about sometimes. You're lucky you've got that Maybe people agree suit. with me. This water's nasty. Got room for two in there? Oh. Oh, gosh. Out shoot him. Oh, my God. Look, I, I'm down in nine health. What are you doing? Come on. Um. So this that encounter just now is also good level design because that zombine came out of nowhere. I was kind of surprised, and then I also wasn't sure. Like I wanted to pick up this barrel and throw it at the zombine, but I couldn't because this fence was in the way. And you're not looking so well. if you're looking around, it's actually really hard to find where the next, where the way forward is. And you only know the way forward when the zombine pops out of this little crack between the pillar and the fence. So, interesting encounter. Well done. She said thank you. Oh, I just died. So this is very close quarters combat. So if you, now that I have such so little health, if I shoot that barrel at all, I'm gonna die. Which is interesting, right? I almost have to prevent Alex from shooting that explosive barrel too, because she might inadvertently kill me. Or I have to figure out some way where I can detonate that barrel from a safe distance. Oh, she gave me a compliment. How nice. Who's she shooting at? Oh, there's a little monster closet here. I'm just gonna turn on god mode so I don't have to keep restarting. Not because I'm bad at games.
Um, in the chat, uh, Appa Yip Yip asks, it's an interesting name, uh, Appa Yip Yip asks, uh, does the Alex AI allow her to detonate explosive barrels? And I'm actually not sure, but I'm just assuming the gunfire code that they that would presumably be shared across all the NPCs and the players would presumably act on explosive barrels in a consistent way. So I would assume she might accidentally pull up the explosive barrel just as like collateral damage or something. But the AI probably does not strategically detonate barrels. I'm actually surprised the flare doesn't light more stuff. It actually has a very narrow lighting radius. I don't believe it. An actual elevator. I would have settled for stairs. Where's that light switch connected to? Oh yeah, it goes into the concrete wall. You've got to be kidding. And now here's the uh, climactic set piece. Two, and I'm pretty sure the sparking wire must be connected to a power supply. We have to connect this sparking wire. So let's find out how to connect it. How do we find out? We have to follow this cable. A level design classic. But sometimes it's hard to follow the cable. Because it visually obstructed so we have to find ways around these obstacles to keep following that cable where'd that cable go oh here's our good friend the cable Here's the circuit breaker. Hey, I hear the elevator. It's moving again. And then we have to run back to the elevator. Wait, did that call the elevator? Yeah, I guess it did call the elevator. Now the now the techno base is ramping up in true Half-Life signature Half-Life fashion. Um, so sorry, I was signaling to someone off screen. Um, now in true Half-Life fashion, there's all this techno. Now we have to defend defend the Alamo. It also spawns fast zombies, which we haven't encountered in this episode yet. Which is interesting. That it chooses this like stressful timer moment, defense moment to spawn fast zombies on you. Um, this is famously, yeah, also a very difficult uh, sequence, as Tugalaw mentions in the chat, um, where they spawn a lot of zombies against you, and a lot of players would die a lot. Because this is actually a very hard area to defend. Um, the zombies can come at you from basically any angle, just like that. So... You know, that wasn't really an easy area to defend. It was basically rigged against you to suffer and die. But I think I'm playing on easy mode, so... Also, I have god mode on, so maybe that's why. I hope it's still light out. Thank God, it's still day. And now that we finished that set piece, I think I'm actually going to stop here because it's been about an hour and I have to move on to other stuff today. So uh, I'm just going to stop here.
But uh, we finished that low life chapter, so not bad. Um, anyway, thanks for hanging out and thanks for watching me play. I hope that was interesting for you to watch. I hope it was mildly educational as well. Um, let's see. Um, next week I'll be here again, uh, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as usual on Wednesdays. And as another reminder, I also stream on Thursdays, uh, 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the twitch.tv slash NYU Game Center channel, where I host a talk show for my employer, NYU Game Center, where we host special guests. And uh, tomorrow we'll be hosting uh, some faculty, and we'll also be hosting Bennett Foddy. Uh, so we'll be finding out what Bennett Foddy's been up to lately and play a fun game with him. So uh, please check out uh, my stream tomorrow, 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and um, anything else? No, that's pretty much it. Thanks for hanging out. Have a good one. Bye.